if we can figure out in an individualized way what each person should be eating to make their health better, it could be incredibly empowering. And along the way, what we hope will be the major thing that will come out of this is some population level insight. That there will be rules that we can apply across industrialized populations. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Hey friends, great to be here with you. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate science degree and a master's in the science of human nutrition. Over the past decade or so, it's become increasingly apparent that the foods we eat directly affect our gut health, which in turn affects physiology throughout our body. One particularly interesting area of research is focused on how particular foods may modulate our immune system via our microbiome, the trillions of bacteria in our large intestine. That is the topic of this bonus episode, which is a throwback to episode 191 of the podcast, with the video from that episode being made available for the very first time. In this exchange, I speak with professors Christopher Gardner and Justin Sonnenberg from Stanford University about a new study they conducted looking at how fiber and fermented foods affect the microbiome and markers of inflammation, a hallmark feature of many of the chronic diseases plaguing Western populations today. A fascinating study with plenty of actionable takeaways and questions for further research to contemplate. Please do enjoy, and I'll catch you on the other side. Dr. Sonnenberg and Dr. Gardner, welcome to the show. It's great to be here with you today. Hey, Simon. Good to be back. Well, great to be here. Yes. Pleasure to have you back. Uh, I think this is your third time now, Dr. Gardner. Crowd favorite. Uh, I'm really looking forward to diving into this new study of yours uh, that was published in Cell Press on fermented foods, fiber, and the immune status. It's a, a very cool study with some really interesting and instructive findings before we jump into it it's 1 p.m here now as we re record this i'm curious have have either of you had any fermented foods today already and if so what were they i've had um both cute homemade kefir and um and then i just actually had some kimchi with lunch and um i'll definitely have some com homemade kombucha before i go to bed tonight Okay. Wow. Gosh, we, we might need to get those recipes at some point. What about you, Dr. Gardner? So I was just showing off my kombucha. So <laughs> it's growing right next to my desk. I, I had a, some kombucha with lunch just now for breakfast. Mm -hmm. One of my staples now is avocado toast with kimchi. Okay. Well, I had av avocado toast with kimchi this morning too. So some synergy yeah. there. Um, and I'm, I'm sure the I, I noticed both of you said homemade kombucha, and I'm sure as we progress, we'll talk about different types of fermented foods and how to choose fermented foods if we are looking for certain benefits. Um, so we can perhaps explore that in, in a little bit. I thought we could quickly start here first with a, a top level summary of the field of science studying the microbiome and perhaps the the best sort of on-ramp here, given uh, Dr. Sonnenberg, this is your first time on the show. Perhaps you could tell us about your personal journey into science and broadly speaking, the, the type of research you're conducting with your team at Stanford and the types of questions that you are interested in, in exploring. Yeah, for sure. I, um, you know, I, I actually started off as a, a glycobiologist, which is a, a scientist that studies um, sugars and not just sugars that we think of in our diet, but the, we actually have um, these carbohydrate structures that, that coat each one of our cells in our body. Um, many people have heard of mucus secretions that um, are how our body uh, keeps microbes on our cell surfaces at a safe distance. Those are uh, made largely of, of carbohydrate structures. And so um, my PhD was actually studying the glycan structures that are, are important in different biological processes. And one of the really important um, uh, roles that these glycans play is in interacting with microbes. So uh, viruses, influenza virus, cholera toxin, there are a lot of 
uh, pathogens and, and pathogenic factors that bind to these carbohydrate structures. And um, it's thought that a lot of these interactions are actually negative for our biology. But I was just starting my postdoctoral fellowship when we were starting to realize as a field, when science was starting to realize that um, beneficial microbes can bind to these carbohydrate structures as well. And that really intrigued me, This the kind of opposing roles that pathogens and beneficial microbes could play in um, binding these structures and interacting with our body. So I, I started, um, I, I embarked on a postdoctoral fellowship on the gut microbiota, which of course is this dense community of microbes in our gut that, um, that perform all sorts of incredible functions that we can talk about. Um, one is helping us digest food, but they also play a really important role in, in uh, dictating our gut health and interacting with the mucus lining and, and carbohydrate structures in our digestive tract. So um, that kind of launched me into that postdoc. And then um, in 2008, I started my lab here at Stanford studying the gut microbiome in more detail with the major thread being um, how does diet play a role in dictating which microbes are in our gut? What do these microbes do and how does that impact our health? Very cool. So perhaps we take a little moment here to define a few terms. I, I heard you mention microbiome and microbiota there, and I understand they're kind of used a little bit interchangeably, I think in, in, in lay sort of conversations, but they have a different meaning. So as a scientist, how do you uh, refer to these two terms and what do they actually mean? Yeah, they, you know, there, there is some debate about it. And so actually we have slipped into the, the lay practice of using these terms interchangeably. Originally microbiome was meant to mean the, um, the collection of microbes and their collective genome. So the, basically the, you know, if we think about the human genome, it's the microbial counterpart of that. But then uh, other, another definition for microbiome was proposed that suggested that it's more the ecosystem living in context of a given environment. So you might say gut microbiome, and that means the whole ecosystem of microbes mm -hmm. living in your gut. Um, we, and then microbiota would be like the individual, the, um, thinking about the individual species of, for instance, bacteria that make up this um, microbial community, we, we've basically begun to just use these interchangeably because there is some um, debate in the field and we just feel it's, it's safer to, to use them interchangeably. Okay, cool. There's, <laughs> you, you mentioned there science has, has kind of, uh, or, or you mentioned sort of in your career progression, science started to figure out a lot of this stuff. And I'm curious, is, was that down to technological advancements that allowed us to start getting visibility into things that we couldn't see, or is it skill development? Can you walk us through that? Yeah, it's, it's a pretty crazy, um, leap that the field has made over the past uh, 10 to 15 years. And, you know, I think the essence of the question you're asking is why now? I mean, if we go back, you know, a hundred years, there are papers in the literature um, documenting that we have this, you know, crazy complicated microbial community living in our gut. There's even papers documenting that you can change this community with diet. So why was, if that was known in the early 1900s, why, why have we learned so much over the past 10 years? And the, the answer is really sequencing technology. The fact that, um, you know, incredible sequencing technology was developed to uh, elucidate the, the sequences of the human genome. And once the human genome had been established um, very, you know, well, kind of at the um, kind of 2000 to 2005, the um, question was, what else could we use this sequencing technology for? And it was, you know, understood that there was a complex community in our gut that we really didn't understand. And what a great use of the, uh, the sequencing technology to turn it towards this microbial community. And, you know, a lot of the focus was on the gut, but of course we have microbes all over our body surfaces, um, you know, in, in our airways, in our, in our nose, uh, vagina, they're, the microbes are on our skin, they're everywhere. And so the, um, human microbiome project in the United States and several other efforts around the world really focused on turning the sequencing technology to elucidate um, and, and basically define what microbes and what genes are um, in our gut and in different parts of our body. And that really laid the foundation for the ensuing wave of investigation that has led us to a more mechanistic understanding of how these microbes are really, you know, critical components of our biology. 
Sounds like a very uh, exciting time then to be a scientist in this space as those that that visibility is is being uh, discovered. Yeah, it's it's been pretty wild actually. Um, my wife and I kind of chose this field to study for our careers before it was really realized how important it was. It just seemed like this massive curiosity, a bunch of open questions, and we could just kind of see a you know an interesting careers worth of kind of interesting questions to pursue. And then over the following, you know, 10 years after we joined the field, there was just this incredible biomedical explosion where people started to realize that these microbes could impact um, how much weight you gain, what your status of your immune system is, um, even influence aspects of um, your central nervous system, like neurodegeneration. So there's just a, you know, there they're basically part of this complex integrated system that is our, our body. It's just that they're malleable. They can be changed. They can deteriorate. They can be impacted really profoundly by things like antibiotics. And so um, because they're a, an integral component of our biology, but can change so rapidly, um, it means that they're, they're something that um, it have, uh, you know, our microbiome provides tremendous potential for impacting our health, but it also represents an incredible vulnerability. How important is that in terms of then sort of when you think about the, the human genes versus these microbial genes and explaining the, the kind of very rapid onset of a lot of these chronic diseases and autoimmune conditions and, and allergies, it seems like this could be a very possible explanation for much of what we're seeing. Yeah, completely. You know, I think that the um, sequencing technology initially focused on the human genome really took us down the path of thinking, how can we connect uh, kind of polymorphisms in our human genome, kind of normal variation in, in human genes? Um, how can we connect those to predisposition for different diseases? So are there genes that will give you know people a bigger chance of developing heart disease or autoimmune disease or so forth? And I think what has um, come of that is that we understand that the, you know, there are a lot of genetic variants in our human genome that play a fairly small role in that sort of predictability of whether you will get a certain disease. And that then points us towards thinking about other factors that likely explain a bigger share of our predisposition to get a, a disease. And uh, certainly the microbiome is one of the major candidates now, I would say. Mm -hmm. That comes from kind of a, a huge body of literature that shows that, you know, for instance, in am animal models, if you change the gut microbiome, you can change the progression or severity of these different diseases mm -hmm. um, that, you know, diseases that are the equivalent of what's filling our hospitals for humans. But it also comes with the recognition that um, as we've industrialized and, um, you know, changed our lifestyles very drastically in the industrialized world over the past, you know, 100 years or so, introduced antibiotics, uh, C-sections, baby formula, incredibly sanitized environment. You know, a lot of these things have had tremendous benefit, but I think what we didn't realize is that there's also likely been collateral damage where our commensal microbes have been harmed unintentionally and changed. And it, it may be that that changed uh, microbiome is at the basis of changing our immune system, changing our metabolism a bit. And then that sends us on a trajectory of disease that may not manifest for, you know, decades later in life, um, for, for many of us, but, um, it does appear to be a, a kind of a key candidate right now. When you say commensal bacteria, that is the, the microbes that we, that, that we, uh, see living in people within the first few years of life and then a kind of part of their microbial fingerprint for the rest of their life. Is that, is that what that yeah, means? Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Th thanks for pointing that out. So, you know, they, um, the word commensal is basically used by the field in a way that I think many lay people use symbiosis. So it's basically organisms just living with one another over time. The, the thing that commensal, the way that commensal is used is that it's 
somewhat agnostic to whether the interactions are beneficial or detrimental Mm -hmm. where symbiosis implies, even though it means um, literally living together, it does imply that there's a a beneficial interaction in many people's the way that they use that term. So commensal just means microbes were in partnership and then it kind of, you know, remains to be determined whether Mm -hmm. the interactions are are beneficial or not beneficial. And it gets back to your prior question of, you know, we have these, microbes inside of us that we like to think of as beneficial, but if they are in a um, kind of a dysbiosis or a misconfiguration relative to what is healthiest for humans, they may be driving us towards these different sorts of Western diseases. And therefore thinking of them as, you know, um, a symbiont may not be uh, as appropriate. I'm, I'm interested in terms of as a scientist, uh, what what defines a, a healthy microbiome? What are the characteristics of a microbiome that are healthy? And then when you say disruption or people talk about dysbiosis, what is actually changing in the, in within the microbiome or within the gut in general that that is perhaps leading to inflammation and perhaps uh, influencing some of these disease states? Yeah, fantastic. So the, you know, this question of what is a healthy microbiome is an incredibly difficult question. And it's, it's actually the key question that the, you know, all of these projects that started sequencing the microbiome that they sent out, set out to address, you know, uh, 10 to 15 years ago. And the, the thinking at that time, which was very reasonable was that if we sequence the microbiome of a bunch of healthy people, we should have a pretty good idea of what a healthy microbiome looks like. And as comparison, you know, sequence the microbiome of diseased cohorts, you know, people that are suffering from different diseases, and that should give us kind of this frame of reference of healthy versus disease. What we've come to realize is that even healthy people, um, have an increased likelihood of developing a chronic inflammatory disease or developing heart disease or, you know, developing one of these kind of Western diseases, one of these non-communicable chronic diseases. And it um, leads to the question of whether um, the microbiome of a healthy person is not actually a healthy microbiome. It may actually be a microbiome that's predisposing them to these different diseases. And so then the question, becomes um, how what is the way to develop to develop an idea or a concept of of a healthy microbiome or features that you might find in a healthy microbiome and so there are different approaches to this now so we don't still don't have an answer to your question but some thinking is if we go into populations that are pre-industrialized mm-hmm. and look at their microbiomes before they get exposed to antibiotics or um, you know have a, a bunch of perturbation to their microbiome we may get a sense of the mm-hmm. gut community that's better adapted to our biology. And so there's a, a large effort now to understand microbiome more globally in different mm-hmm. populations that live traditional lifestyles. Um, but I think that, you know, there, there definitely is within just an industrialized um, world uh, um, or within the industrialized world, a concept of what features in the microbiome partition with, Um, more severe disease states and those that are associated with healthy people. That doesn't mean that those features are a healthy microbiome, Mm -hmm. but it does mean that they are in, you know, seen in many health. Is some of that work uh, in traditional non-industrialized communities uh, being done with groups like the Hadza? Yeah, exactly. So we've done some work on the Hadza gut microbiota. So the Hadza um, or a group of, uh, hunter gatherers that live in Tanzania and, um, you know, are, they are undergoing rapid lifestyle change. Now there's just a lot of, um, factors impacting their lifestyle. Um, but they do live a life a lifestyle that is primarily based on, um, you know, hunting and gathering and their microbiome is much, um, more diverse. It has more species. It has different species of bacteria present than industrialized populations. And what's really interesting is, um, many of the bacterial species that we see in the Hadza, we also see in other hunter gatherers found in other parts of the world that, you know, have been, um, s- separate from the Hadza for, um, up to, you know, 100,000 years or more. So, um, these are, you know, appear to be features of the microbiome that are more representative of what 
humans microbiome may have looked like throughout our evolutionary history and therefore maybe what our human genome has come to expect and adapted to for a microbiome. So there may be some really interesting information in these traditional populations, microbiomes in terms of what is healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but there are also are higher incidence of, um, parrot, you know, um, what we would consider intestinal parasites in many of these populations. So potentially some bacteria or other, um, pathogens, parasites that can cause a disease and inflammation. So, um, you know, we, we have to be careful about what we conclude. We also have to be careful about, um, things like bioprocess bioprospecting or biopiracy. Um, these traditional populations quite often leave, lead a very vulnerable existence. And, um, you know, all of the research is, um, needs to be carried out with a, a, a lot of consideration of these populations mm -hmm. in mind. Yeah. For sure. You, you mentioned, uh, diversity, then, and I know that was one of the things that you were interested in looking at in this, this study that we're going to get to. And I promise you, Dr. Gardner, we're going to get there and talk about food, uh, and bring you into this. Um, I'm interested in, in microbiome diversity as a scientific term and how you think about it. I know that that's a word that I think is thrown around a lot now and a lot of people are probably familiar with it, but again, it does seem like it's open to interpretation. So as a, as a microbiome scientist, what, what does that mean to you? Yeah. Um, let me, so let me explain kind of how I think about diversity and then I can talk about it in the context of these different kind of populations and healthy and disease states. Cause I think that helps contextualize it. So d d when we talk about diversity, there are different ways of thinking about measuring diversity, but you know, a very simple way to think about it is just, you know, a, a jar of jelly beans um, and where each jelly bean represents a different microbe in your gut microbiota. And so if you only have, you know, uh, red, Red and green jelly beans, um, you in your jar, that's a very low diversity microbiota compared to one that has many more colors in it, like, you know, orange and blue and purple and so forth. And so, you know, I think the, just thinking about the different species that are present in the gut microbiome is a, um, one easy way of thinking about diversity. And if we just, for instance, count the number of species, the, these kind of different colors that are present in our, in our gut microbiome, um, we uh, can see quite often the trend is that people with more diverse gut microbiomes ha are healthier. They have lower markers of inflammation, better metabolic markers, and quite often people that are in disease states, either metabolic syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, um, several autoimmune diseases have less diversity in their gut microbiome. Now, this always leads to the question of whether it's causally related to the disease or it's a product of the disease, whether it's upstream or downstream. And there's different pieces of evidence pointing to the microbes contributing to these diseases that we can talk about um, if, if there's time. But I, I think that, you know, in this spectrum of Western microbiomes, it appears that more diversity quite often couples with health and quite often couples with a healthy diet. Now, if you go into like the Hadza or some of these other populations that live traditional lifestyles, there's even more diversity on top of that. So uh, a greater extent of diversity and um, less chronic inflammatory diseases, even though many of these populations live to, you know, fairly old ages, um, it, it appears that they um, you know, don't suffer from these same sorts of, you know, what we call Western diseases, um, as people that live in the industrialized world. Now, the, um, the issue of diversity is an interesting one because there are disease states, for instance, in the vaginal microbiome that are associated with too much diversity. So it's not always the case that more diversity is better. There are ways that ecosystems, microbial ecosystems can go off the rails and gain too much diversity in the wrong way. But a very general rule is that in the context of the industrialized microbiome, more diversity is generally coupled to better health. And you mentioned inflammation there. And again, that kind of feeds into this study here. Uh, I think uh, people will be familiar with, uh, you know, intestinal permeability and, or uh, leaky gut. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, how does, how does all of this come together? If you have disruption of the microbiome and say loss of diversity, how is that potentially affecting permeability and inflammation there, you know, it's, um, 
a, a great question. And I think the, it's not an intuitive one to think that, you know, their gut microbes and what they're doing and what, what uh, species are present can directly impact our immune system throughout our body, right? I mean, the um, ability to fight off a respiratory infection or even for an immunotherapy to work in cancer, they've shown um, at, at distal sites in the body away from the gut can be directly impacted by the microbes that you harbor in your gut. And one reason is that the microbes in our gut are constantly conducting metabolism. They're growing, they're helping us digest our food. And in doing so they're secreting small molecules that then get taken up into the bloodstream. So all these little microbial metabolites get taken up into our bloodstream and affect our body and, and, you know, can circulate throughout our body and affect dis sites that are distant from the gut. So it's important just to recognize that even though the microbes themselves are largely confined to the gut, um, they can influence the rest of our body through secreting these little chemicals. Now, it also is true that the microbes in our gut um, can use the mucus lining of our gut as a backup food source. So that mucus lining that I was telling you about is made up of carbohydrates can also be used as a food source for the microbes. If we're not feeding the microbes, if they're not taken care of with like you know, a high fiber diet, for instance. And so as the microbes start to um, rely on this mucus lining for their own sustenance, they can actually erode that mucus lining. They can start pressing closer to our intestinal cells. They should be away from the intestinal cells, but as the mucus disappears, they get closer and then inflammation can result as they get too close to the intestinal cells. So that's, for instance, mm -hmm. one mechanism by which microbes in our gut can incite inflammation. But then the leakiness is a whole other issue that's incredibly complicated where um, that barrier that is supposed to keep both microbes and then other macromolecules, other components of our diet and components of microbial cells away from our cells and, and out of our bloodstream, that can start to break down if our interaction with our microbes is not what it should be. And that leakiness can lead to molecules getting into our bloodstream that then um, promote inflammation rather than dampen it. So if you have a healthy gut, you have microbes that are away from the, the colonic cells. There's a nice healthy mucus layer. The microbes are conducting metabolism where they produce short chain fatty acids, one of their metabolites that, that actually dampens inflammation and the, the system is in harmony. If you have a microbiome that's eating mucus, getting too close to your epithelial cell lining in your gut, and they're not secreting those short chain fatty acids, you end up with a degraded barrier. You can end up with molecules leaking across and, and uh, heightened inflammation that can drive, uh, we believe Western diseases. I should note there on, on the point about the, uh, microbes eating the mucus mucosal layer, there's a, a great YouTube video that your wife did, uh, Erica, uh, where she discussed that. So I'll put that into the show notes. If anyone, anyone wants to kind of explore that a, a little bit further. Uh, so I think that was a, a great explanation. And with all of that in mind, that then leads to this idea, I'm assuming, where you start thinking about, well, if we understand how the microbiome can be connected to disruption of the mucosal layer, to uh, increase permeability, inflammation, potentially these disease states, perhaps through diet, we can modulate the microbiome, change what's happening in there, and then affect these disease states and things downstream like inflamm inflammation. And with the hope of regaining some control of our health or staying healthier for, for longer. Uh, so that brings us, I guess, to this study. And I get my first question here is uh, why the collaboration between you two T talk to me about the Genesis uh, behind this study. Well, well, you know, everything that I'm telling you about with the um, dietary change and mucus utilization by microbes is all work that we did in our lab in 
mouse models. We, you know, our expertise is really using mice and we actually have mice that live in sterile bubbles that we call germ-free mice where they have no microbiota and we can colonize them with a single species. So rather than hundreds of species living in their gut, there's one species and it's, we can create very controlled uh, experimental conditions for starting to un unravel some of this complexity. And then you can add a second microbe and look at how the two microbes influence one another and how they impact the host and um, change diet and do all this really kind of elegant, but, you know, not human experiments. And so we could really see that diet was this incredibly powerful lever, lever for changing the microbiome and diet, you know, isn't regulated like a drug. And it, it means that you can go in and start doing experiments in humans using diet, um, because, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, you know, a safe, safe component of, of what we do every day. And so, um, so we were really interested in, in extending our work into human studies, but we are terrified of humans. And the, the reason is that if you do science, you want highly controlled experiments where things are very reproducible and very controlled. And when you start studying humans, you have, you know, tremendous variability. You have all these people with their own kind of habits and um, own stubbornness and, and ways of doing things. And mm -hmm. so we really, so, so working with humans is its own expertise that we had no background in. And um, we, I was lucky enough in um, on uh, May, uh, I think it was May 13th or May 14th, 2013 to meet Christopher Gardner, uh, my colleague at, uh, from Stanford, but we were both attending meeting up in Seattle. And, um, so we had both heard of each other and we, uh, we spoke at the, in the same session and, um, kind of pointed to each other across the room and said, I know you. And, and we, uh, had a, um, at dinner that night, a wonderful conversation where we just sat and talked about all the possibilities of working together, tying humans, diet, and microbiome together with a lot of the other things that are going on at Stanford, like immune profiling and, and other things like that. Um, just that there was this tremendous potential. Potential. So it was like we were kind of each holding two separate halves of an amulet when we met that evening. Talk me through this study, the how you came to designing it, the specific questions that you wanted to uh, answer or explore, and and, and then uh, you know what the study design looked like. Well, if you don't mind, it'd be kind of helpful to go back just a little bit. So uh, when Justin and I ha had that dinner, I had the ongoing weight loss, low carb, low fat diet fit study going on. And he said, ah, you know, here's a missed opportunity. What if you went in there and collected some stool samples from those folks? And really quickly, we could start analyzing some data. I said, are, are you kidding me? That I'm, I'm poking him with needles. I'm, I'm asking him to eat different stuff. They have to get measured and weighed and you want me to ask him to do something else. Okay. Look, it's not approved in the human subjects committee thing. So I can add it as an optional thing. They're already enrolled, but dude, this is poop. Poop is icky. They're just, they're not going to want to do this, but I'll humor you. So we went into our ongoing set of folks that we were recruiting right then. I said, you know, I don't even know what we're going to tell you about this thing. It's poop. It's icky, but I have a colleague. He looks like an awesome guy. Who's willing to volunteer for this extra thing that's not required? 80% of them raised their hand. It was actually staggering. And then I said, you know, here's the details. Here's the thing you got to put, mm -hmm. take home and you got to put it in the freezer and you got to bring it in later. And they did it. They were incredible. So we actually, Simon got an initial paper published on that, looking at the diet fits. And we can get into that later if you want. Then we started writing some grants together. And I, I, I'm sorry, but I think this is an important part of the story here. Justin and I have had five NIH grants rejected where we sort of got into the complexity of humans eating food and then the diversity of the microbiome. Mm -hmm. And when you apply to NIH, you have to have an outcome mm -hmm. and the best of it's a rigorous, clear outcome. And our outcome was inflammation mm -hmm. and inflammation isn't a clear outcome. There's just hundreds of factors that you can look like in the cascade of events metabolically that happen during the inflammatory process. And so we kept saying, okay, well, you know, we're going to modify the human's diet and, and check out the microbiome and look at inflammation. And 
the reviewers kept coming back saying, this is a huge fishing expedition. You know, we need, need something really solid here, a very clear hypothesis. And this field doesn't lend itself to that right now. It's too open-ended. So we continued to write these NIH grants, but we started getting small amounts of funding from donors. And actually we got some industry funded studies to look at supplements. So we had a prebiotic and a probiotic supplement. If you want to get into the difference of that in a moment. And it was sort of after doing four or five studies and, and getting those going that we said, okay, actually we now have some donor money. We can do whatever we want. What is it that we want to do? And Justin was very keen on all the fibers that he's been looking at as the microbiota accessible carbohydrates, not just fiber, but the max, the microbiota accessible carbohydrates. And, and I said, ah, oh, but you know, the, the public is just fascinated with fermented food too, prebiotics and probiotics. Can we do that? Why don't we do both? Why would we leave one out? And down the road, I, I come to learn that he was humoring me. He just wanted access to these humans said, you know, I don't really think we need to study the fermented food, but mm -hmm. let's make this guy happy. He's going to recruit the humans for us. And so That's, this is true. This is it true. was a very interactive process. Like, you know, we, we're creating mm -hmm. a lot of things where the, the field mm -hmm. was not established. So, you know, in our initial talks, this was presented as a blank canvas. We could get people who are healthy, who are overweight, who are kids with allergies, who are older folks with inflammation. A lot of choices there. Which microbes are we going to look at? Are we going to look at diversity as mm -hmm. an outcome? Okay. And then the clinicians are going to want to know what they might tell their patients. Are we going to look at C-reactive protein? Uh, not everybody likes C-reactive protein. So, oh my gosh, there's some technologies and methods on campus where we can look at hundreds of inflammatory markers. And so we started to sketch this out and we came up with FIFIFO, the fermented fiber rich food study, where just for the sake of ease, we didn't have a ton of money. We got generally healthy individuals, 36 of them, and randomly assigned uh, 18 to fiber and 18 to fermented food. And uh, I'll pause for a minute just so we can ask some extra questions, but the mm -hmm. coming up with a dose and the duration and the approach was, was a whole evolution of thought also. But that's, that's kind of how it got started. I'll see if Justin wants to add anything to that. Yeah. You know, I think the, um, it, it's a wonderful background. I enjoy hearing Christopher talk about this. The, <laughs> um, you know, the, I, I think from the standpoint of the microbiome field, there was this recognition that um, our microbes are fundamentally connected to, you know, all parts of our biology and um, yet they're malleable. And so it really, um, they give us an opportunity to potentially tune our biology in different ways. Um, and the fact that diet is the major factor um, that we have day to day for changing our gut microbiome, changing both the function and the composition of it, it really kind of the big picture here is, you know, if we can learn the rules of how diet impacts our microbiome and how those changes then go on and impact our health. Mm -hmm. um, and we can kind of create a map of that, a better understanding. Um, it will give, it will empower people to make choices on a day-to-day -day basis that are best for them and their health with the idea that every person is a little bit different. You know, what we're trying to accomplish, um, whether you're trying to, you know, run a marathon or, um, do well on, a um, on the SAT or maybe have a baby or maybe reproductive health is really important. You know, I mean, there's, there's all these different mm -hmm. parts of our life, um, that we are trying to optimize for different things. And the big picture here is if we can figure out in an individualized way, what each person should be eating, uh, to make their health better, um, it could, it could be incredibly empowering. And along the way, what we hope will be the major thing that will come out of this is some population level insight that there will be rules that we can apply across, you know, industrialized populations for things that people can do generally to make themselves he healthier and live yeah, longer, more productive lives. Great. So let's walk through the methodology a little more here. So you had these 36 subjects, who were they? Were they uh, healthy adults? And, uh, 
I know that you, in the fiber arm, you increased the fiber they were consuming. And in the fermented food group, they added quite a significant a number of fermented foods per day. Can we get into the specifics of that and what those kind of doses look like? You know, this really was a result of multiple debates because these weren't rats and they weren't germ-free rats and they weren't in a cage. And we really don't know which specific fiber from which specific food has an effect right right now. So let's just start with that. So one option was to give them a supplement. And if it was a supplement, how many different fibers would it have? And I'm definitely a whole food person. And my inclination is to go with, well, I'd really like to see people make some major changes in their diet. You can get fiber from grains, from fruits, from vegetables, from nuts, from seeds. Why, Why don't we just try to get people to eat a lot more fiber And those fiber supplements are a little hard to gum down after you've swirled them up in a glass of water or orange juice or something. Couldn't they do better if they were really eating more of those foods? So uh, let's sit down and figure out who this would be. Let's make sure we exclude people who are already really big plant food eaters that didn't have much room for improvement. So we cut it off at about 20 grams of fiber per day. And we said, you know, how much would, how much should we ask for? Why don't we go for 40 grams a day? And so, I mean, this is kind of an approach that we've taken in some of the other studies I've had a chance to talk about on your show, like diet fits, where in that study, we tried to get people to go as low as they could in carbohydrates or fats. This was how high can we get them in fiber? And will they get kicked out if they don't get to 40? And that doesn't work with humans. It actually just doesn't work from a scientific perspective that you kick them out. And a challenge that I find in this field is if you say, okay, my hypothesis is 65 grams of fiber and they got to 40 and here's what we found. Then you get criticized for being wrong because they didn't get to 65. So the goal was basically as much fiber as you could get down your gullet (laughs) and maintain. So we kind of gave them four weeks in a ramp up phase Mm -hmm. with uh, a fabulous dietitian, Dahlia Perelman, who we call the diet whisperer. She's so good with people at being patient and empathetic and saying, okay, can you eat more? Can you eat more? Can you, can you stay there? Okay. If you can't stay there, if it's uncomfortable, then you have to come down. We're not trying to um, put you through any pain or discomfort here, but really want you to ramp up and eat as much fiber as you can. And so it wasn't actually a set number, but it ended up being higher than 40 grams a day Mm -hmm. on the diet side. And so we took the very same approach with fermented food, which I think some people find a little crazier than it actually is. So we sat around the table and said, you know, these are people who hardly ever eat fermented food. So we had baseline data. They they rarely, yogurt, Mm -hmm. maybe. They really weren't eating sauerkraut or kimchi or drinking kombucha or kefir. Said, you know, how much should we try to get them to eat a day? And we kind of started adding up the calories in a serving and said, you know, for some of these diet interventions, unless you change about a quarter of your diet or something, you, you may not see a big impact. So why don't we get up in the range of 300, 350 calories? And that ended up being six servings a day mm-hmm. of fermented food for, among people who were really not eating any. And once again, we weren't holding them to six. It, it was just a goal thinking the more you could eat, the more likely you will give your microbiota a signal to, to be modified and so that we can detect something that's happening. And in, in fact, most of the participants got to six servings a day, keeping in mind that sometimes a cup of vegetables is actually two servings or a bottle of kombucha that you'd get in the store is two servings, mm-hmm. not just one. So this just meant having some yogurt for breakfast and drinking a bottle of kombucha and maybe having a half a cup of kimchi at one point and a half a cup of sauerkraut at some point, it really wasn't that many calories, but this was the initial phase of the study was dose and duration. Mm -hmm. We actually started collecting blood and stool every two weeks because another challenge, Simon, and I'll, I'll flip it over to Justin here in just a sec. How long do you need to see people Mm -hmm. change to see the microbiome change? And if, if we could do a two week study, we could do a lot more studies. If it really takes four, that would take longer. If it really takes eight, that's important to know because you don't want to stop short of achieve, achieving a detectable signal. So Justin, what do you think of our discussions about dose and duration? Because that was a really important part 
of starting this, if you can imagine there's any number of doses, any number of types of fermented food and fiber, and any, anything's up in the air for duration, and you only get one once you start your study. Yeah. And I, I think beyond, you know, trying to maximize everything to, to see a signal, I, you know, the other thing that struck us was a lot of the um, comments that we got back on our NIH grants that were not getting funded. We get reviewer comments and quite often they were pushing us in the direction of using uh, supplements rather than food. Mm -hmm. So they would say, you know, instead of doing fermented foods, you should do something more controlled like a probiotic supplement. And maybe instead of high fiber foods, you should use a prebiotic supplement that has one fiber versus two fibers and so forth. And so we just thought that, you know, going with food and going with diverse food, when we had this donor money um, that was very kindly given a, given to us to you know allow us to do a, a study design that um, otherwise wouldn't be funded was really important. Hey friends, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. A quick message from one of our sponsors who makes this show possible, and then we'll jump straight back into things. If you're familiar with my nutrition philosophy, you will know that I'm a huge believer in plant-rich diets being better for people and our planet. You'll also know that I frequently draw attention to what I describe as nutrients of focus. These are nutrients that science shows plant-based eaters, whether plant predominant or exclusive, can fall short in, which can leave you feeling run down, lacking energy, experiencing brain fog, and generally just not as vital as you'd like to be. For that reason, together with Emil, a plant-based health and wellness company, I formulated Essential 8. Essential 8 is your one-stop multinutrient, formulated with DHA, EPA, omega-3s from algae oil, vitamin B12, iodine, vitamin D3, iron, zinc, selenium, and calcium to perfectly complement your plant-rich diet. I personally take Essential 8 every morning with breakfast, just two capsules, much easier than supplementing with these eight key nutrients individually. What's even more convenient is I have a monthly subscription, so it turns up automatically on my doorstep and I never miss a beat. To get yours, head to theproof.com forward slash friends. That's theproof.com forward slash friends, where you'll find a link to purchase Essential 8 that will get you an extra 5% off your first order on top of the significant subscription discount. There will also be a link to this in the show notes. Okay, back to the show. On fermented foods, I think uh, an interesting point here would be the the definition that you used for fermented foods, because uh, you know there are fermented foods like tempeh, for example, where most of those do not contain live cultures. Uh, kombucha seems to be a bit of both. There's some that's raw. There's some that's not raw. I'm not sure what the kind of live culture status is of those products. And then there's pickled foods, which are sometimes uh, confused with fermented foods. So can we kind of clarify what fermented foods are specifically and what your instructions were to those subjects? Well, the, you know, the, um, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, there are these, uh, various categories out there that are kind of related that you can find in the store and, and they, um, the lines are blurred and it can be very difficult for a consumer to navigate. And so what we used is our definition of fermented foods were foods that had been, um, you know, transformed through microbial activity and that still contained live microbes in them. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, um, you know, foods are, are the ones that you mentioned, things like kombucha and kefir and sauerkraut and kimchi and yogurt. Um, but there are versions of many of these that you can buy that are either, um, you know, were fermented, but have become canned and are no longer, no longer contain live microbes. So for instance, if you buy canned sauerkraut, that's kept at room temperature that may have been fermented to have, you know, microbes may have helped create that sauerkraut, but they kill all those microbes in the canning process. So that wouldn't count as a fermented food in our study. Likewise, um, or, um, somewhat different in contrast, pickles, um, can be naturally fermented, um, with microbes and those microbes generally produce, for instance, a lot of acetic acid when they're pickling them. So it leads to that kind of vinegary taste when you eat pickles. Um, 
companies have figured out that if they just put cucumbers into vinegar, they can kind of reconstitute that um, fermented taste. And that's, you know, a pickled pickled food that just has um, the, the vinegar in it. And uh, those may be either refrigerated or they may be canned. Um, but if they just have added um, acetic acid or vinegar in them, they don't count as a fermented food or wouldn't count as a fermented food in our study. And there are even, um, you know, versions of these pickled foods now, and a lot of actually um, kind of processed foods that add microbes at the very end. So those microbes mm -hmm. are not part of fermenting the food, but they're added at the end so that on the label, the manufacturer can write contains probiotics and, mm -hmm. or contains live microbes. And so you really have to be aware that it's a naturally fermented food, that it contains live microbes that, you know, most likely will be found in the refrigerated section. And so for this study, we required those naturally fermented foods that contain live microbes. And, um, you know, we don't know whether pickled foods or foods that had been fermented and then canned have, it's possible mm -hmm. that they may be beneficial as well. We just didn't study them. But yeah. It's a, it's an important point when considering the sort of generalizability of the, uh, find the results, which we'll walk through. That's an, that, that point there about the addition of probiotics afterwards is really interesting because I wonder most most dairy products, yogurts that that say live cultures. I'm I'm assuming those are fermented, but I wonder there are a lot of plant based yogurts popping up that also say contain probiotics, live cultures, and whether they're actually fermented or that's added afterwards. Yeah, and so a good thing to look for on those labels is whether they contain lactic acid or acetic acid as an ingredient that's been added. Because if you see that, that quite often is the marker that they're artificially creating the sour taste by addition of chemicals and they aren't naturally fermented. And, um, there are other instances. I actually just had a kombucha that my um, friend brought me from Costco. And I was wondering how, you know, kombucha can be mass distributed like this because, you know, if it's a living food and it turns out that it, what, I could infer based on the ingredients is that they created the kombucha through natural fermentation. They then canned it to kill everything. And then they added a microbe back that is actually a spore forming microbe known as bacillus coagulans. That's a kind of quote unquote probiotic organism, not something that's naturally found in, um, kombucha usually. And so they can write on the label contains live microbes and naturally fermented kombucha, but the microbes that were used to naturally ferment that kombucha were actually killed prior to, mm -hmm. to um, packaging it. So, so it's a very tricky, you have to be able, you have to get good at reading the labels mm -hmm. and understand what the different ingredients mean to really figure this out. Okay. I think that's, that's very instructive. Okay. So you, you run this study of the four week kind of, uh, uh, run in period. And then you have uh, 10 weeks, these two different arms. One group is upping their fiber as Dr. Gardner explained. The other group's adding these six serves of fermented foods to their diet. You're measuring, you're taking blood samples. There are stool samples. You're looking at, uh, inflammation and the diversity of the microbiome. What do you see? Well, and just to clarify the design, so we had a, a three-week baseline period where the participants didn't do anything. There was a four-week ramp period and then a six-week maintenance period. So the, that total intervention okay. time, including the ramp, is 10 weeks. And then there was a four-week kind of washout, choose your own kind of, you know, they could, they could stop or they could continue the food as they liked it. They, and traditionally, in these sorts of studies, there's a washout where you stop treatment, but Christopher wisely refuses to make people go back back to a, a crappy diet after teaching them how to eat good food. And, um, so we let people choose whatever they want at the end of the, for the, for the washout period. Um, yeah, so we could, we collected blood and stool longitudinally over that in, entire time. And the, you know, the very simple analysis here is just to ask the question of what, what do these participants look like at baseline? What do they look like at the end of the study? And is there a change that's happened across the cohort and the, um, really, big signal that was um, very impressive was uh, the, there were two really for the fermented food group. 
One was an increase in microbiome diversity. So these people um, somehow increased the number of micro, microbial bacterial species in their gut microbiome. And many markers of inflammation decreased over that same time. And in fact, even if we look at intermediate time points, um, so not just the beginning and end, but the intermediate ones as they were progressing, we see a, a gradual increase in diversity over the fermented food intervention and a gradual decrease in these inflammatory markers. So it's, it's kind of the, um, the, uh, result that you would hope to see mm. for a healthy dietary intervention in a, um, in, you know, in a Western cohort, I will say that, you know, my hypothesis, and I think much of the field to this point would hypothesize based on work that's been done in, in animal models and so forth, that that sort of signal would be expected in the high fiber group, mm. not the high fermented food group, because fiber is, you know, what mm. we're missing in our diet in the Western diet bringing it back should be able, should allow for recruitment of new microbes should allow for a bunch of fermentation and products of these microbes to go in and dampen inflammation. So we saw the signal that we expected. It was just not in the intervention arm that we expected. Mm -hmm. So fact, that was Simon, he, he wrote me an email and he said, are you, are you sure you got the groups, right? Can you go back and tell me, <laughs> you know, we've been blinded to this, this whole time, A and B. Is it really B and A? Because I, I think mm -hmm. you might have mixed those up when you <laughs> sent them to me. Justin, would you add to this? I think one of the critical points is that um, in Justin's lab, they did a very thorough job, Simon, of going out and purchasing some of the same products and the same brand names that the participants were choosing because we did make recommendations. And you might expect that the microbes that were in those foods mm -hmm. would appear in your gut. But really the increase in diversity that we saw was far beyond those specific microbes. Justin, you want to take that? Yeah. And, and just to um, add to that, you know, there were some of the microbes, you know, I think something like 5% of the new species that appeared were from the fermented foods. So that confirmed that we didn't, you know, there wasn't any mislabeling mm -hmm. of the arms that occurred. It really confirmed that this was the fermented food group and that many of the species came from, from somewhere else. On that point, uh, and my understanding was probiotic supplements, for example, when you take them, those probiotics may have sort of transient effects in the body, but they don't stick necessarily. Uh, and I may be completely wrong there. Um, are you, are you sort of saying that some of the bacteria in the fermented foods seem to take up residence within the, the microbiome, or is that something that you would need to kind of test over a longer period of time to determine? Yeah, we, we'd probably need to test that over a longer period of time. There, there was um, a decrease in those species uh, through the washout period. But again, some of these people were still consuming fermented foods. Most mm -hmm. of them were consuming some. And so it's hard to know whether that signal was stable colonization versus additional fermented food microbes that were running through. There is, you know, it's interesting, probiotics um, come in, you know, different flavors. There, there are some probiotic bacteria that were originated in fermented foods and therefore are, for instance, milk adapted, many of the, you know, lactobacillus species, for instance, there are other probiotics that originated in infant feces, infant stool, many of the bifidobacterial probiotics. And those were used um, decades ago to cure diarrhea in infants that were suffering from diarrhea. And they've been used for so long and have such a great safety profile. They now are allowable as probiotic supplements, even though they're derived from the human GI tract. And there are actually even some lactobacillus that were originally derived from the human GI tract. So the, the um, origin of the probiotics matters because in some studies, if you take a um, fermented um, uh, a milk fermented food adapted strain, it most likely will not take up residence in your gut because it's not adapted for your gut. Mm -hmm. But in trials that have been done with, for instance, bifidobacteria that are gut adapted, the bifidobacteria will take up permanent residence mm -hmm. if there's an open niche, if that strain doesn't already exist in the gut microbiota. So quite often in these studies, you'll see um, uh, there's a really beautiful study from Jens Walter's group showing that it, um, about half the people stably engraft the probiotic strain and half mm -hmm. of them don't half of them, it just washes through and disappears. And so, um, so anyway, some of these probiotic strains can stably engraft in our study, 
um, we think that these are probably mostly just transiently appearing and disappearing. But the vast majority of the diversity are gut resident strains, probably not originating from the fermented foods. We don't know exactly where they're coming from. Okay. We might, we might come back to that point around uh, probiotics and uh, microbiome testing a little later if we talk about personalized nutrition and some of the, the tests that are uh, or the toolkits that are becoming available. Uh, on this fermented food group, um, what was the average consumption, that sort of six-level target? Is that where subjects got to? Was there any difference that you saw perhaps in subjects that consumed less serves on average per day compared to those that consumed more? Or was there any information around particular fermented foods that seem to have a, a sort of unique effect on the microbiome? So it was less, uh, you know, in terms of dose, it's, the sample size wasn't large enough to see a dose effect. But as, as I was trying to explain earlier, what if you really hated kimchi? Does that mean you couldn't be in the study? What if you really wouldn't, weren't willing to drink kombucha? And so they could get their six or a day any way they wanted. And in fact, some people really um, preferred the yogurt. And some people bought these gut shots that they were taking that originally weren't in our list, but that qualified. And when Justin and the group analyzed the data, there were some specifically larger contributions from some of the foods. So Justin, take that back. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, it, it was, um, uh, you know, the by design, this study was meant to not test individual fermented foods. It was just to get people eating diverse mixture of fermented foods, but we could go back and see if there were, you know, larger effects, for instance, on gut microbiome diversity of people that ate more yogurt or ate more, drank more kombucha. And so in doing that analysis, it really looks like, um, the, you know, the biggest impact in our study, um, was, um, yogurt followed by, uh, actually a fermented vegetable brine drink that is commercially called gut shots. It's basically mm -hmm. just the, the, you know, liquid salty liquid from, you know, fermenting sauerkraut. It's interesting and notable that both of these, um, products are high in, um, lactic acid. They have lactic acid in, in them. And there's some fermentations that tend more towards acetic acid, like, you know, taste more vinegary and other ones that taste more mellow, um, due to lactic acid. And so we're actually, you know, one of the beautiful things of, um, working with Christopher's group is to generate all these hypotheses that are based in human studies, and then to be able to reverse translate those back into our lab and study them in animal models. And so right now we're testing in the lab using a mouse model, whether lactic acid can have an outsized impact as one of the prime micro microbial metabolites in fermented foods that seem to have a big impact on gut microbiome diversity. Very cool. So perhaps not all fermented foods are created equal. Exactly. I'm, I'm interested before we kind of flip over to the fiber arm and, and what you noticed there, because that was also very interesting. Uh, this fermented uh, food group, you saw on the aggregate, a reduction in some of these inflammatory markers. I'm, I'm interested in Firstly, what you hypothesize was going on here. Uh, what is it specifically about the fermented foods that you think was causing this reduction in inflammatory markers? And I also wonder, and this is probably a little bit of a nerdy question and perhaps digressing, but I'm curious uh, if you thought about measuring intestinal permeability at all. I know that some studies look at zonulin and there seems to be some kind of debate as to whether that is a good biomarker and measure of intestinal permeability or leaky gut, so to speak. Right. So the inflammatory markers, so just to, to back up one tiny step and we covered this a little bit in the intro, but, you know, I think it's, um, classically in, um, you know, the immune system is tremendously complex. And so classically there hasn't been a great way to monitor people's inflammation status. And there, you know, are studies out there that monitor, for instance, C reactive protein or CRP, other studies that mention, um, monitor other markers like, you know, interleukin six or IL six. Um, there are these very specific markers, but these are, you know, uh, two of, you know, 
hundreds to thousands of different facets of the immune system that one could monitor if the technology existed. And um, we really reasoned that a broader readout of inflammatory status was going to be important to get a broad view of, of where the immune system was sitting. And part of this is embedded in the hypothesis that um, chronic simmering inflammation in the industrialized world is what's driving um, many people in our society towards these different chronic diseases, like, you know, everything from heart disease to cancer to autoimmune disease. And so we were really looking for something that could move the needle on a broad array of markers, indicating less simmering inflammation with the hope that that, you know, potentially one day we could study and would show less Western disease development in people that had lower, lower inflammation. So that's kind of the backdrop here. We have a, a wonderful uh, human immune monitoring center at Stanford that allows for, for looking at, you know, 300 to 400 different markers of inflammation for each blood draw. And so that's what we did over the course of this study was monitor a really broad array, um, kind of what we call comprehensive immune profiling um, to get a sense of people's immune system. And we saw you know, 20 to 30 of these different markers decrease over the course of the intervention. So really this broad signal of decreasing inflammation. So very, very convincing signal. Now, what um, you are asking is, is what was causing that? And that's kind of the, the million dollar question. And really one of the detractors of doing experiments in humans is getting to the mechanistic insight. So we know from a study like this, we get information that we know is relevant to humans. It relates to diet. It relates to our microbiome, um, gives a really robust signal in the immune system, but being able to iterate on the experiments and ask follow-up questions mm -hmm. of, was it the bacteria in the fermented food? Foods? Was it the metabolites? Was it lactic acid? Was it something that was happening in the small intestine? Did it even depend on the gut microbiome? Could this be fermented foods interacting with our gut lining directly? So these are all follow-up questions that we're pursuing now in mouse models to iterate on this and try to get to the mechanistic explanation. But you hit on a really important question here. We'd love to know why it is fermented foods are um, causing uh, decreases in inflammatory markers. Do you see that that approach as as a sort of more effective, better use of time for science going forward, where you first try and start in a human uh, setting and then work backwards, as opposed to running lots of animal studies and and working forwards? Yeah, I think we have to be very careful about, um, you know, I, I think both of these approaches are incredibly important. There's a, been a tremendous amount uh, that we have learned from just the mouse studies, and there's an aspect of being able to do biomedical science and be able to conduct research that's translational and impacts humans that relies upon this tremendous foundation of basic science being done outside the context of human studies. And so I really think the two complement one, mm -hmm. one another very well. I think what we don't want to get trapped in is explaining mouse biology for the sake of doing beautiful science. We want to use mice in a, a really you know, either way to inform broad principles that give us this like broad foundational knowledge or in this reverse translational sense. So I, I think we have to use both methods mm -hmm. complementary uh, in complementary ways. But I do think that this way of, of doing microbiome science where you start in a human and you reverse translate to understand it is incredibly powerful and being embraced by more and more people around the field now. And then to your question about the permeability, you know, this was some looking at leaky gut in this study. This was something that we um, considered and talked about. And the, you know, the methodology for this is um, it's evolving rapidly right now in the field. You mentioned zonulin. There are other ways of looking at um, different sugar markers that are not metabolizable, but can be absorbed um, either through natural transport processes or through a leaky barrier and looking at ratios of sugars um, can, can be a, a marker of leaky gut. And so, um, so we considered a lot of these and decided at the end of the day, um, we're stuck with a, a finite budget and a finite number of things mm -hmm. that we can study and trying to target that to the assays that we think are the, the, you know, most robust and the most likely to give us a signal. So, um, at the time, uh, the leaky gut assays didn't make the cut. They were a little bit too complicated and, and a bit of a leap into the unknown for us, but I think they're of huge interest and, and are kind of on the menu continually. And we'll probably be incorporating those into upcoming studies. 
going to ask you a question and, and you've kind of answered this, but it may be on the, the top of some of the listeners' minds. And I think it's interesting nonetheless, if, if someone perhaps doesn't enjoy fermented foods mm. uh, and they're thinking, well, maybe I can just take that probiotic supplement. Uh, any, do you have any opinions on that? Is there any information from this study that could help inform whether a probiotic supplement could have similar effects to these fermented foods? Well, interestingly, yeah, we can't answer that question because we obviously didn't do it that way. But as we transition to fiber, what's going to be an interesting overview from our study, Simon, was just in the way he's framed this is, is fascinating. The folks who were eating the fermented food ate different doses of different amounts. There wasn't any one way to do it. But the findings were quite consistent across the 18 people in the group. Just sort of, yes, get more probiotics in your diet. You're going to see the fiber result on the one hand looks null. On the other hand, it actually looks very precision nutrition oriented mm -hmm. if you want to go that next step. And so, I don't know, Justin, I, I would think that overview of it, it wasn't, didn't really matter which way they did it. There seemed to be overall benefit would suggest that, sure, some people could try those probiotic supplements. The challenge is, what is the dose in there? Are they still living? Is this a standardized type of thing? It's not, it's not FDA regulated. Which ones did they stick together by the time you actually consumed it? How many bacteria were still alive? Back to you, Justin. And, and, and we don't know that the might that the bacteria are the things that are having the impact. Yeah. You know, it may be the metabolites, it may be other aspects of the transformed mm -hmm. food. So I think you can try probiotics, but I just think it's a, a different approach. You know, the one thing I will say is that, you know, in, in researching this area and looking into it more, there are thousands of fermented foods from different cultures around the world. Um, a lot of them do have this acidic, you know, kind of um, tangy component, but there are a wide variety. And so people may you know, there's, there's kind of the handful that you typically run into in the store, but people may want to look into, you know, other types of fermented foods out there beyond the, the handful that you can get easily in the store, because they're pretty easy to make at home. And it may be that you can, you know, um, do, do some, some home experiments to find a fermented food that kind of suits your palate. And I'd hate for the folks who like yogurt, Simon, to go out there and get the peach, guava, pineapple, mm -hmm gobs of sugar yogurt yep. that's low fat thinking, oh, and I'm helping my, my microbiome here. I just went to the store yesterday and there was a mild kimchi and a spicy kimchi and a different, and I've had a lot of people say, yeah, I, I just don't like kimchi. And I said, so how many times, how many times have you tried? Yeah. I just tried it once. It wasn't mm -hmm. it. Oh my God. There's so many different kinds of kimchi. So be open. What about the, the sodium content of some of the fermented foods? Is that, is that a consideration for everyone or anyone in particular? Of course, you know, uh, they're not all very high in sodium, but did, did you look at sodium intake and is that a consideration for people to sort of take, take, uh, take into mind? I don't think we looked at sodium, but at least that's one of the standard things on a nutrition fact panel. So it'd be pretty easy to see. And it'll tell you sort of what percent of your daily amount that you're not supposed to go over was in that one serving. And, and Hannah did look into this, Christopher, and I don't, I don't think it, it may not have made the paper, but, um, people did not increase sodium significantly during the fermented mm -hmm. food intervention based on the dietary record. So it appears that people are compensating in other aspects of their food. If they're getting a lot of the kind of more highly mm -hmm. salted fermented foods, potentially Simon. So I, I, you know, I, I think people should be aware of this, particularly people with high blood pressure and, you know, mm -hmm. they have sensitivities to high sodium foods, but, um, there are plenty of fermented foods that are, that don't contain high salt, like yogurt and kefir mm -hmm. and so forth, the kombucha. Um, so the, you know, if you want to stay away from salt and eat fermented foods, you know, you can, you can find, uh, the, the fermented foods that, that meet those criteria. Cool. So tell us about the fiber group. Uh, you alluded that there was a, uh, a personalized, uh, response. What was your initial response as a team when you saw the results and, and, uh, the, the fact that you didn't see, uh, what you thought you were going to. Well, I, you, you know, I think the, um, startling thing to us was, and, 
you know, in, in thinking about it more deeply, I think we do have an explanation for, you know, and this is in the, in the paper, um, why, why we saw the results we saw, but as I said earlier, you know, we hypothesized that high fiber would increase microbiome diversity, decrease inflammation, and we didn't see a uniform response across the group. And, um, you know, I think, um, this, is, is startling because of our low fiber diets. And we thought, well, you bring fiber back and you're going to be feeding this microbiome and, and really um, creating a great change in the community. What we did see, uh, as you mentioned, is a, um, what we consider a more individualized response. We saw kind of three trajectories of immune response in these individuals, one group that actually became more inflammatory and two groups that became less inflammatory, but in different ways. And it turns out that the group that became more inflammatory when they were consuming a high fiber diet had lowest microbiome diversity at baseline. So suggesting that their microbiome was the least well-equipped to degrade and utilize that mm -hmm. dietary fiber. Um, whereas the, the other two groups had higher baseline gut microbiota diversity and um, probably had a microbiota that was better equipped to degrade and ferment the complex carbohydrates in the dietary fiber. So so I think that those results speak to one, you know, we're all individuals, um, when it comes to everything, but particularly our gut microbiome and two that, you know, um, we have undoubtedly lost fiber degrading potential in the industrialized gut microbiome. This has been established over and over again in different studies. Uh, the ones we mentioned earlier, comparing traditional populations with um, industrialized populations, but also studying, there's a beautiful study looking at immigrants that moved from Southeast Asia to the United States. And one of the um, I, one remarkable part of this study is that their gut microbiome changes within months of landing in the United States. And it becomes um, more, American like the longer they're here and more so over the course of generations. And one of the biggest changes that happens after people land here is they lose their fiber degrading gut microbiome bacterial species. And what we did see in the study in feeding people a high fiber diet was a lot of the dietary fiber components coming out in these people's stool untransformed. And so it really suggests that if you have a low diversity gut microbiome, that's not well equipped for degrading dietary fiber, the fiber will shoot right through you untransformed and your microbiome won't be able to realize the potential benefits of fermenting it. I think it would be uh, important for us to to talk about those subjects who did have that response based on this study and uh, your broader understanding of this literature, looking at this, do you think those types of people would have the ability to adapt and then develop greater diversity and eventually be able to digest the, the increased levels of fiber? Or are they individuals that you believe just aren't suited to a higher fiber diet? That's my first question there. Uh, and, and secondly, if they can potentially increase their diversity and capability, how would they go about doing that? Yeah. Great question. So the, you know, I, one of the other, um, findings in the field, kind of, um, you know, several studies that have looked at people more cross-sectionally and what factors in the microbiome associate with what lifestyle factors is that people that eat high fiber plant-based diets generally have more microbiome diversity. And again, we don't know if that's a kind of, you know, the chicken and egg question, but the, um, I think most logical conclusion to me is that people that eat a high fiber diet for a long period of time are able to acquire diversity over a longer period of time. Because this study was so short, I think it was probably not long enough for people to recruit new members of their microbiome to help degrade the dietary fiber. And so um, my guess is that if you had people on a high fiber diet for you know, a year or two years, you would gradually see people start to acquire species from the outside that would then take up residence in the gut and help degrade that dietary fiber. The um, uh, possibility of including a cocktail of microbes at the beginning of a study like this, that was full of fiber degrading microbes and actually endow people with the ability to degrade dietary fiber right off the bat is a study that we would love to do. And we're actually starting a little research project in the lab now to start 
um, identifying isolating fiber degrading microbes that could be formulated into kind of a, a microbial um, uh, therapeutic or, or cocktail that can be given to people prior to fiber intervention to see if their their microbiome could be kickstarted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's fascinating to see whether like the combination of fermented foods with fiber or the addition of a probiotic could help people because it, this kind of does line up with some of the feedback that I get working with people where some people just seem to find it a little harder to add fiber to their diet. And I'm wondering, uh, and, and I'm not sure whether you collected this information, but perhaps it came up in discussion with the subjects, any sort of subjective, uh, uh, sort of feedback as to those participants who had lower baseline diversity were less capable of degrading this fiber had increased in inflammation. Did they report more discomfort and bloating and those sorts of symptoms? They, to, um, to, I don't believe they did. I, um, you know, the student and postdoc that were analyzing this data sliced and diced in many different ways. And basically the, um, you know, one of the few significant things on the GI reports is just that people that were eating a high fiber diet showed, um, increased motility and, um, you know, uh, um, yeah, kind of more regular bowel habits. So that was one of the, the few changes, um, that one of the issues with doing these sorts of longitude multiomic studies is that they're so expensive to conduct because of all the analyses and all the personnel involved that it's really hard to get big cohorts of people. It's just the budget would be much too large for a reasonable study. And so when we start dividing up the groups, you know, 18 people per diet arm, and then you start dividing them into thirds and starting to do statistics on things like a dietary or a, a, a bloating questionnaire, or a GI questionnaire, um, you, you, um, it's very hard to see things that are, that may be significant. So nothing popped up that I can um, recall, but um, it doesn't mean that it wasn't, mm -hmm. um, it wasn't there. You know, one of the things though, we would, uh, um, these people with more inflammation, we have no idea why a higher fiber diet would lead to more inflammation. Um, because, you know, again, the idea was that the fiber was probably going through untransformed. So, um, there's something going on that we don't quite understand in the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was, I was just thinking it would be interesting for people to somehow identify if they're in the process of changing their diet, are they perhaps someone that is lacking diversity and and is that perhaps why they're uh noticing or experiencing some discomfort when they're mm -hmm. adding more plants to their diet uh on that topic of kind of identifying where your baseline diversity diversity is at and and the sort of microbiome composition it brings me to the microbiome tests um and I, i'm curious you know based on what's currently available are these companies using the similar sort of technology that you use in the lab to measure diversity. And the second part to that question is you seem to measure uh, the composition of the microbiome at a number of different time points. How reliable is just doing sort of one stool test with a company uh, as a sort of uh, to get an insight into exactly what your microbiome composition looks like? Because I can imagine if it's rapidly changing, it, it may well depend on the week that you do the test or the day that you do the test. Right. Completely. Yeah. So the, you know, let me answer the, the second question first. I think the, um, one time point issue is, is a big problem. And part of that is, as you mentioned, kind of uh, day to day or time point to time point variability. And so having, you know, multiple time points and getting a sense of kind of where your microbiome is at over a larger window of time, will give, will give you, um, will make you less susceptible to, um, outliers that might, you know, an outlier time point that might mislead you in terms of your microbiome health. I think the other issue is that there's also technical variability and this gets to the first part of your question. You know, are these companies using the same technology? Uh, many of them are, it's a highly democratized, widely available technology to sequence your gut microbiome. There are some companies that have tried to develop proprietary technologies as a way of developing an uh, intellectual property portfolio or trade secrets, um, that, um, 
quite, you know, they're, they're just not transparent. They're not tested against gold standard and it's um, unclear how reliable they are. And so um, it's really difficult for a consumer to know the data quality um, that arises from these. There are some companies, I don't want to mention any by names that are reputable and other ones that are less reputable. And um, and so it's really a, a kind of buyer beware sort of situation. You have to really take this information with a grain of salt or be willing to look into the background of the company and make sure that there are serious scientists with peer reviewed publications that are part of the um, portfolio of the company mm-hmm. and, and part of what the company is founded on. Now, these companies quite often will not only provide you with a microbiome profile, but they'll also make dietary recommendations based on your profile or other lifestyle recommendations. And this is when I think these companies start to get into a very kind of difficult area. There are a couple companies out there that actually have uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms that um, are trained on large data sets and provide information that is reliable. And then uh, again, other companies that are making recommendations based on something that hasn't been peer reviewed. And it's very hard to Mm -hmm. determine the validity of their recommendations. I would say the field in general is um, uh, uh, largely of the mind that we are not in a position to recommend dietary, you know, specific dietary advice to people based on their um, microbiome profile. There are broad things we can tell people um, that are generally healthy, generally less healthy. Um, and then, you know, uh, one or two companies that are doing this well, uh, tied to blood glucose monitoring and keeping mm-hmm blood glucose from spiking, but in terms of overall health and, and what we should be eating specifically related to our gut microbiome, it's, uh, the field isn't really at that point yet. Okay. I think that's good advice. I know that we're approaching the end of this, uh, conversation. What to, to sort of round this out, what are the key takeaways from this study that you think are instructive now based on, on this study and the, the wider field of science for individuals and for clinicians that they can uh, use to either improve their health or the health of their clients? Well, I'd like to jump on one little mentioned fact um, that's not very rigorous, but we did have that run out or that wash out in our study. Four weeks later, the average participant was eating 30 grams of fiber a day instead of 20 with no gun to their head or anything. And they were eating three servings of fermented food a day, Mm -hmm. not half. And so some of these they found enjoyable because they were still doing them. They weren't part of the study anymore. And so, yeah, the more you, these these are whole foods, you can't go wrong. Um, It just sort of reinforces many of the things that you have done in your plant proof book, Simon. So it's very consistent with that entire message is just sort of another Another strategy to get motivated about this. Um, I want to jump in on sort of the companies that are doing this right now. I think they're ac- they actually may help this process if they were to get thousands of people to do this and collect their data. They would provide some useful information because right now Justin and I have thirty six people, mm-hmm. and we have ninety people in another study, and we have forty five in another study. If they were to collect data from thousands of people, it just becomes a tricky issue when you're paying a company and they're using your data to define the algorithm that will soon be better than the one they have now. I just think it's a very dynamic process and as skeptical as you might be, you could be a citizen scientist here Mm -hmm. contributing to some of that knowledge, as long as you're wary that we don't know enough yet to be making very strong claims. Mm -hmm. And and just to, just to, to add to that, you know, I think the, um, The take home of fermented foods having this cohort wide effect is very encouraging, you know, increased microbiome diversity, decreased inflammation. It's kind of the signature we'd want to see for countering all the negative things that have happened to our industrialized microbiome. But on top of that, it leads to this major question of if you eat fermented foods plus dietary fiber, um, can you have both a highly diverse microbiome that can, you know, utilize the fibers and and reap perhaps additive or synergistic effects of the two. So um, I try to 
to eat a high fiber, high fermented food diet. Um, I think that that really is um, a kind of a lot of other great things besides nurturing a, a healthy gut microbiome come along with that. Um, but, you know, one of the other things that you mentioned earlier that I think is important to highlight is if people try to transition onto these different diets, going slowly, ramping very slowly, if they experience symptoms backing off and just kind of staying persistent and making it a kind of a long-term um, goal of changing uh, your dietary habits and how you eat really makes it um, easier to approach and less likely to result in GI symptoms that might drive you away from it. Beautiful. and. One other question I, I have around the kind of generalizability of these findings. Uh, these were healthy adults, I, I believe that we said that earlier. I'm sure there'll be people tuning in with inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis or uh, ankylosing spondylitis or inflammatory bowel disease, et cetera. And they might be thinking, hmm, I wonder how this applies to me what would you say to them or to practitioners that are helping patients with these kind of inflammatory conditions? Well, that's where the advice to go slowly comes in. Can't go overboard and say, wow, I heard Simon's podcast. So I'm all into this when in fact their microbiome isn't prepared mm -hmm. for that load of fiber, or they're, they're not even happy with the fermented foods. They're just choking them down because they're waiting for a result. And it's causing them personal stress in the process mm -hmm. of eliminating some of their favorite foods. So go slow. Fermented foods for the most part are healthy. Uh, what I would love to see Simon is some more people making food at home. If you really wanted to have some control over this, Justin makes a lot of these things at home. I've got kombucha on the desk counter next to me. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be good to get people back in charge of their own food. Well, I might have to get your recipes and, and I can share them with the community. Some of them are in the good gut book. There we go. The yes. recipes are there. And, and that, that is uh, Justin and Erica's book that I do recommend everyone go and, and grab a copy of The Good Gut. It's fantastic and it really does expand on a number of things that we've spoken about here and, and plenty, plenty more, that's for sure. Thank you so much, gents. This has been super, super insightful. I hope we get the opportunity to, to carry this conversation forward uh, sometime in the, in the near future. Uh, I did actually want to mention, I, I came up with a joke after listening after, sorry, after reading your study. Uh, so we, I might leave you with that. Uh, it goes like this, knock, knock. Who's, Who's there? there? Kim. Kim. Kim Chi. <laughs> 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 it's a corny dad joke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much, gents. I think we did it. I will uh, add, a, add a link to the study in the show notes along with the link to your book. I hope you guys uh, enjoy your holidays coming up and get uh, enjoy a day or two off. Please stay well and uh, let's make sure we do this again soon in the future. Sounds great. Great Thanks, to be Simon. with you, Simon. Thanks so much. A pleasure. Thanks, partner, Justin. You're always fun to talk with. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Christopher. Thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science-based conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive. If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format. Yes, the full-length videos. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a review on Apple or Spotify. Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show, or questions that you'd like to have answered, please leave those in the comments section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take note of these comments when planning future episodes finally the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends enjoy your week stay well and i look forward to catching you in the next episode